they still lay. Well, it's a wonderful day today. Is it not? Yes, of course it is. What I want to talk to you about this morning is something that uh, all of us probably enjoy reading just before bed. And that's genealogies. And they do make compelling reading at bedtime or at any other time for that matter. You might welcome them with a big yawn. Or perhaps you skip over them completely as you read through the Bible. You get long lists of bewildering names and all the begats and begots, yet they can reveal some interesting insights into God's plan of redemption. And today I want to give you the brief overview of some of the insights from Genesis 5, Matthew 1 and Luke 3. And we'll go through each of those chapters verse by verse. So I hope you don't have a roast in the oven because it will be burnt when you get home. No, I wouldn't inflict that on you. Just open to Genesis 5 and you'll be able to follow it down the line as we go. And Genesis 5 starts off, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man or Adam in the day on which they were created. And then it goes on where Adam had lived so many years and he begat sons and all that stuff. And so we find that there is some importance in genealogies. I don't know whether I switched it off or not. I haven't got that little green light in the front. We'll go to the next one. Thanks, Richard. And I've given you a little outline there where genealogies represent continuity and relationship. It's a family tree. Often in the ancient Near East, they are used for purposes of power and prestige. Linear genealogies start at point A well, in this case, it's the creation of Adam and Eve, and they end at point B, which is where I'm going to stop from chapter 5, before it goes into Noah and the flood. And the intention is to bridge a gap between major events. Alternatively, they can be vertical, and that traces the descendants of a single family. You can <coughs> see the... Uh, single family of Esau in Genesis 36 as it traces down the nations that developed from the family tree of Esau. And vertical genealogies focus on establishing legitimacy for membership in the family or the tribe. I'm going to try the next one, see if this works. And so we come there and there are two lines. There's the apostate and the godly seeds. And it's especially in the line of Cain that we find the arts of social and civilised life cultivated. Some people get surprised at that. 
But if you read the relevant chapters of Genesis closely, you'll see that it's the line of Cain, the ungodly line, that increased in power, wealth and luxury. In almost all earthly advantages, they attained a superiority over the simple and rural life of the family of Seth. They afford an instance of the high cultivation which a people can often possess even though they are altogether irreligious and ungodly, as well as the progress which they may make in the arts and the embellishments of life. In fact, one of the line, can't remember his name offhand, is the one who invented music and all sorts of musical instruments. Another one was the worker of metals. They were not in the godly line, they were in the ungodly line. In the godly seed, which is perpetuated through the family of Seth, we find that his name signifies appointed substitute, placed or firmly founded. For on him now was to rest the hope of the promised Messiah. So God ordained and so uh, Eve believed. The posterity of Seth maintained the cause of, if I can use the word religion, but the cause of God in effect during increasing degeneracy. It's also God's way of writing history. Bible history is written on the principle of abridgment and selection. Never gives you the full story. And sometimes we find that between verses, there's actually a span of sometimes decades. I mean, if you stop and think about uh, when Noah came out of the ark after the flood, Noah planted a vine, grapevine. How long does it take a grapevine to grow? And then it fruited. And then he picked the fruit. And then he made himself a batch of wine and got as full as a tick. Now, when you look at it in that sense, how long does it take from the planting of the vine to the making of wine sufficiently alcoholic to get him drunk? It doesn't happen from this verse to that verse. There's a span of time in between. And sometimes you need to realise that when you're reading scripture, that there is a span of time sometimes between verses. Now God himself, being the author of the Bible, writes the Bible story of his own world in his own way and according to his own plan, keeping in view that which would most glorify himself, what would most benefit the church, or in the first place, Israel as a whole, what would mark distinctly the stages leading on to the incarnation of his son, and what would prove the true humanity of the Messiah as the seed of the woman spoken of in Genesis 3, 15 to 17. And so the embodiment of the grace and truth which is wrapped up in the first promise to man at the seed of the woman, and that's even interesting in itself. The woman does not carry the seed of life. That comes from the man. The woman has the egg. You've got to have both. You fertilise the, the egg in the ovary and you get a good uh, explanation of that in that ad for something or other, Toyotas or whatever it is. But this says the seed of the woman. How can a woman have a seed? And the answer was simple when you get through, as we know, and Mary became... Uh, pregnant because she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. There was no man involved. 
but she conceived in a miraculous incarnation of God himself. So that Jesus Christ was born in a holy human way, was wholly human, but at the same time was totally sinless because there was no seed of man in him. Anyway, that, that's getting off the topic. The first verse, which we read earlier, carries us back to the earlier chapters and repeats the statement already given as to man's creation in the divine image. It's plain from it that God desires us to look at and ponder such things as these. And so we get... Let's try this again. Man's creation by God, his creation in the likeness of God, his creation as male and female, his being blessed by God, and that he enters this world as a blessed being, not under the curse at all. And he receives the name of Adam, or man, from God himself, as if God specially claimed the right of nomenclature, or naming, to himself. And it's interesting that the person in authority is the one who names those who were subject to his authority. Adam was given dominion over the animals and then the animals were brought to him and he named the animals. The one in authority named the ones who were to be subject to him. Who named Eve? Adam. And so the woman is subject to the authority of the man. But having said that, I want you all men to fully realise that you have as much authority as your wife gives to you. How do I say that? Because in Ephesians 5, it says the wife is to submit to the husband. And his authority is a spiritual authority to pray for, a physical authority to care for. It doesn't mean you are the boss. It doesn't mean that at all. Because in God's eyes, male and female are totally equal. They're complementary to each other. But the male has a spiritual authority and the wife is to submit to her husband. If you've got a wife who doesn't submit, you've got no authority over her. But if you love her as Christ loved the church, she'll willingly submit. I'm off the topic again, aren't I? That's the trouble. When you get old fellas, they tend to get on little rabbit holes and you're chasing rabbits down holes everywhere. Chapter 5 actually contains 10 biographies, certainly abridged. Such is God's estimate of man and man's importance. How unlike man that we don't have an estimate of, our, of ourselves equal to that in which God places us. Particularly when you're in Christ, do you see yourself as God sees you? A new creation in Christ Jesus. And the importance attached to the names is just this, that they belong to the line of the woman's seed, and it was this that made them worthy of memory. God had commanded Adam and Eve to multiply. Now with each man and woman enjoying literally hundreds of years of parental productivity plus almost ideal environmental and climatological conditions, the earth could well have been filled with people long before the flood. In fact, I found one little statistical example with an initial population of two people, increasing at the rate of 2% annually, which is about the 
estimated annual growth at present. In 1,656 years, which there was between Adam and the Flood, that would generate a population well over 10 trillion people. Now, I don't know if the Earth would ever hold 10 trillion people, but what it does show is that it's not impossible for there have to have been a very, very significant population on the Earth at the time of the Flood. Other children were born to Adam and Eve, not just Cain, Abel and Seth. They are mentioned because of their particular importance in the history as God writes it. But it also says that Adam and Eve had other children. And of course the importance of the line of Seth is that he was the appointed son leading eventually to Christ. Adam was created in God's likeness, but Adam begat Seth in his own likeness. In other words, the seed of sin passed on through Seth because that was in Adam after, they, after he and Eve blew it in the garden. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. The chronological framework of primeval history showing a total of 1656 years from Adam to the flood and there's no internal evidence to suggest there's any gaps in those records. The lifespan of the antediluvians, that's a fancy name isn't it, averaged over 900 years. To be exact it was 912 excluding Enoch. So there were vastly superior environmental conditions. These great ages have been questioned. The sceptics will always find something to question. However, in an excavation near Babel, a king list was excavated, which tells of ten kings in Babel, all of whom lived to great ages before the flood which verifies that, once again, archaeology has verified that the Bible is correct. And the next uh, slide – whoops, it worked that time – gives you the chronology of the patriarchs. Now that, that's just to demonstrate the fact that uh, there was 656 years between Adam and the flood. Now you might say, oh yeah, but Lamech goes on a bit further. Notice that he died in 651, five years before the flood. We'll go through that shortly. Apart from the chronology, There's an importance attached to names. We might go to that one, I think. The meaning of the patriarch's names. And I'll go through a bit of an explanation while you've got that sitting up there. Adam means man or mankind, and with, but without the breath of God, the essence of mankind is dust. We're nothing but dirt without the breath of God in us. In fact, I believe that my mineral value at my weight is something like about 35 cents. That's the mineral value. I don't know how much they'd pay for the dust. Top dressing for the garden. Seth, his name means substitute appointed one or foundation. Adam was created in the image of God, but Seth was begotten in the image of Adam. He was another seed, a substitute to replace Abel, and thus it continues the re redemption plan of God and the path of the coming Redeemer. Enosh, 
mortal frailty, illustrating man's utter helplessness and frailty due to sin. But it was during his time, the Bible tells us, that people began to call on the name of the Lord, seeking to establish personal relationship with him. His son was Kenan, a child, one begotten. His son was Mahalel Alel, which means praise of God, God be praised, glory to God. And only God is worthy to be praised, and praise unleashes God's power. Just think of the walls of Jericho. It was the people in obedience to God's direction and through their praise that the walls of Jericho came down. And I was reading through that once, and it says that the soldiers of Israel ran straight in over the walls into the city. And I thought to myself, now wait a minute. If the walls fell down, there's piles of rubble, how can they go straight in over the rubble? They've still got blokes inside who want to fight them. And it came to me that perhaps God's power resulting from the praise that the walls had been pushed down into the earth, leaving standing that part of the wall in which Rahab's house was, was uh, built. And I didn't tell anybody that because they look at you like you're a bit weird. But I was at university at the time and uh, I'd be studying anthropology, believe it or not. And I found there in an archaeological journal a report where they'd studied the uh, ruins of Jericho. Now, there have been seven Jerichos, apparently, and they made the particular point that on the fifth Jericho, the walls appeared to have been pushed down into the earth. And I thought, wow. <laughs> There's some confirmation from archaeology once again to what I thought I'd read in the Bible. Now, you can take it or leave it, doesn't really matter. But it does make sense that if the walls were pushed down, the Israelites ran straight in. Remember, they'd surrounded the place, and you even with walls crumbled, you can only get in through the gates. And if the gates collapse, they're full of rubble as well. Never mind, we've also got the battle in Second Chronicles 20, where they, the Lord said, Send out your army. I'll look after this mob that's coming against you. And then the king, Jehoshaphat, he went a step further. The Lord didn't tell him to do it. He said, righto, all you Levite singers, you go out in front of the army. And they went out singing praises to God. And when they got there, they're all dead. And it took them three days to pick up all the goodies. I think they were singing Psalm 136, actually. If you read through it, you'll see, you know, that it's actually uh, a repetition of the history of God's dealings with Israel and what a mighty God he is. Praise to God. His son was Jared, which means descent, descendant, or to go down from a higher place. Hope that God, who's worthy to be praised upon the foundation of faith laid by Enosh, Kenan and Mahalel, would come down and save them. He lived longer than his forefathers and he was 32 when Adam died at age 930. Jesus humbled himself and came down from a higher place. Enoch was Jared's fruit of faith. His name means dedicated initiated successor. He was the first to teach mankind that whoever walks with God will obtain eternal life. 
There is a way to reach heaven without dying by transfiguration and ascension, being caught up. Elijah went the same way. Enoch walked with God and the scripture says he was not for God took him. Hmm. I wonder if that's a, uh, a little foretaste or a foreshadow of the rapture. Maybe. Then we have Methuselah who's famous for being the man who lived the longest. 669 years. But what does his name mean? When he dies, judgment. Or, another version I see, when he dies, it will come or it will happen. Lamech, son of Methuselah, his name is strong youth or conqueror. His power through prayer. He was 113 when Enoch was translated. He lived the shortest lifespan of them all, 777 years. Now the number seven, of course, is the perfect number and 777 to me uh, means completion, perfect completion. He died five years before the flood and his son Noah was the one that God saw and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He remained faithful. Now there's no doubt that Noah had a lot of siblings but obviously they went the way of the world, they went the way of the line of Cain despite all his preaching. But the name of Noah means rest or comfort. Perhaps Lamech thought Noah would be the promised saviour who would bring rest. He was born 126 years after Adam's death, <clears throat> 69 years after Enoch's ascension, and 14 years after Seth's death. Now, I'm not saying that this is exact, but on the next slide, I made this up out of the names. <clears throat> Let's see if you agree with me. Man's appointed substitute had mortal frailty demonstrating man's helplessness. Yet there was a child begotten to the praise and glory of God whose descent was from a higher place. He was dedicated and when he dies it will happen. He will conquer. And then came rest after it happened. Now, I might be reading a bit much into it, you might say, but I think that's a gospel message, isn't it? In the names in that genealogy, we have a gospel message. God's promise of a saviour. And after the death of the one who was dedicated, who did a child begotten to the praise and glory of God who came down from a higher place. Then he died. Of course he rose again. And then came rest. We can rest in Jesus our Saviour. The antediluvian world was totally corrupt. <clears throat> and remember that our world is rapidly following that path. Once again, the line of uh, Cain is rising up. Now, if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 1, we don't turn to Luke 3. I'll have a bit of a comparison as we go through. A casual reading <clears throat> of the New Testament may cause a person to wonder why it begins with something, excuse me, <coughs> something as seemingly dull as a family tree. 
One might conclude that there is little significance to be drawn from this catalogue of names and thus skip over it to where the action begins. But the genealogy is indispensable. It lays the foundation for all that follows. Unless it can be shown that Jesus is a legal descendant of David through the royal line, it's impossible to prove that he is the Messiah King of Israel. So Matthew begins that account where he must, with documentary evidence that Jesus inherited the legal right to the throne of David through his stepfather Joseph. <clears throat> Now, this genealogy in Matthew traces the legal descent of Jesus as King of Israel. The genealogy in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 3, traces his lineal descent as son of David. Matthew's genealogy follows the royal line from David through his son Solomon. Luke's genealogy follows the bloodline from David through another son, Nathan. This genealogy concludes with Joseph, of whom Jesus was the adopted son, uh, son, and in Luke 3, probably traces the ancestry of Mary, of whom Jesus was the real son. You see, a millennium earlier, God had made an unconditional agreement with David, a covenant in fact, promising him a kingdom that would last forever and a perpetually ruling line. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That covenant is now fulfilled in Christ. He is the legal heir to the throne of David through Joseph and the actual seed of David through Mary. Because he lives forever, his kingdom will last forever and he will reign forever as David's greatest son. Jesus united in his person the only two bases for claims to the throne of Israel, the legal and the lineal. And since he still lives, there can be no other claimant. So the subject of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The name Jesus presents him as Jehovah Saviour. The title Christ, which is just Greek for anointed, as the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. Messiah also means anointed. The title Son of David is associated with the roles of both Messiah and King in the Old Testament. And the title Son of Abraham presents our Lord as the one who is the ultimate fulfilment of the promises made to the progenitor of the Hebrew people in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now, on the next slide, we find that there are five women mentioned. But before we get there, make the comment that both genealogies of Joseph and of Mary meet in the person of Zerubbabel. So they sort of go up, back to Zerubbabel, and then they go back out to Solomon and Nathan again. It's interesting that uh, David and Bathsheba actually had five sons. The first one, the son of adultery, died at eight days of age. The next son was Solomon, who became king after David. They had three other sons, one of whom was Nathan. So both the royal line and the lineal line, or the bloodline, both come from David and Bathsheba. Of some interest too might be the uh, mention of a king named Jeconiah. In Jeremiah 22:30, God pronounced a curse on uh, Jeconiah that none of his descendants would ever sit on the throne. 
None did, and therefore Joseph, although he was of the royal line, he couldn't claim the throne for himself. And some of the other things that you get in that genealogy is the mention of the women. Now, it was most unusual, particularly in the Middle East, for women to be included in a genealogy. It was a patriarchal society. Although I'm told that to be a Jew, your mother has to be a Jew, not your father. And yet uh, the Israelites are a patriarchal society anyway. But it's through your mother that you get your Jewishness. And it's quite astonishing when you look at it and you find out that two of them played the harlot, one committed adultery, and the other two were Gentiles. Tamar, some people think Tamar was a Canaanite. In fact, if you read it closely, she's an Israelite. Her name means palm tree, and she was the daughter-in-law of Judah, who you might remember in... Uh, Genesis uh, tricked him through pretending to be a prostitute. There's a story there too. And I think this is part of God's plan also. Judah had married a Canaanite woman, so his sons were not pure bloods, if you want to put it that way. They were not pure Hebrew. They were half Canaanite. And uh, from what little you can gather from Scripture, they were probably rat bags. Two of them died in strange circumstances, but God's hand was obvious. And Judah didn't want to lose his third son, so he, he didn't follow the prescribed method of the day and give Tamar, the widow of his first two sons, to his third son. <clears throat> he probably thought she's bad news. She's a man killer. Anyway, on his way up to Shear Sheep, he sees a, what appears to be a temple prostitute on the side of the road. So he nicks in and has intercourse with her, and of course she falls pregnant. When he finds out that she's pregnant, whoa! burner but as payment or guarantee of payment he'd left his staff which has his family tree on it and his signet his signature he'd left them with Tamar so Tamar sends him back a message and says the father of my child is the owner of these and she sends him back the staff and the signet he says an interesting thing. She is more righteous than I. And then we find that Judah, who was the leader of the pack in getting rid of Joseph, wanted to kill him first and then sell him off. And He, he was a pretty nasty pasty. After the incident with Tamar, and she is more righteous than I, Following on from that, Judah is still the leader of the pack, but he's the one who stands up before Joseph and offers himself as a substitute hostage instead of the younger son, Benjamin. He had completely changed from a guy who didn't give a hoot about his family tree, didn't give a hoot about morality or anything like that, to a man who was upright and righteous because of that one act. She is more righteous than I. There was a total repentance and a move back towards God. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho. <clears throat> Her name means proud or arrogant. She sheltered the spies sent into the city by Joshua and was given the token of the red cord, symbol of the blood over the door in Egypt and she and her household were saved. She married a fellow called Salmon, who may have been one of the spies, and was the mother of Boaz, the great-grandfather of David. Ruth was a Moabite, 
and daughter-in-law to Naomi. Her name means friend. <clears throat> also a Gentile, she came to faith in the God of Israel. <clears throat> Married Boaz and became the great-grandmother of David. Bathsheba, who's mentioned in the genealogy as she, her who had been the wife of Uriah, her name means daughter of an oath. And once again, we get an interesting little thing there. It's not a genealogy, it's just an interesting thing in a couple of verses. Her father was Eliam, one of David's mighty men, as was Uriah, her husband. But Eliam was the son of Ahitophel, one of David's advisors. And he went with Absalom when Absalom rebelled against his father David. Possibly Ahitophel did that as an act of vengeance for what happened with his granddaughter Bathsheba. She and David committed adultery and, as I said before, they had five sons. So, what can we learn from those genealogies? If we go to the next one, we find their inclusion in Matthew's introduction is perhaps a subtle suggestion that God brings, or Christ brings, salvation to sinners, grace to Gentiles, and that in him barriers of race and sex would be torn down. And I think that's true. If you read through the letters of the New Testament consistently, the barriers of race and social status and sex, it's all torn down. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We all have the same blood doesn't matter what the colour of your skin is, your blood's the same, provided you get into all the positives and negatives and all the various things, but the blood is the same. You can give someone who's black a trans, uh, blood transfusion from a white person or a Chinese person, a red Indian, doesn't matter, the blood's the same. And there's something else <clears throat> on the next slide. I believe that these five women, Tamar was a woman of hope. She hoped for a better future and she did. She was the mother of Perez and his twin brother and it's through Perez that the line continued. Rahab was a woman of faith. She had faith in the God of Israel simply because of what she'd heard about the God of Israel. And she put faith in the God of Israel. She put faith in what the uh, spies told her. She put faith in the spies. So she was a woman of faith. And she's called that in Hebrews 11. Ruth was a woman of love. So there's three words, hope, faith and love. They appear somewhere else in scripture, don't they? At the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And these abide, faith, hope and love. And the greater of these is love. Have you got faith, hope and love again? Bathsheba was a woman who received unlimited grace despite everything that she'd done with David. Unlimited grace. And Mary, well, she was a woman of unconditional obedience. Be it done unto me as you have said. No worries. The angel spoke to her the word of the Lord and she said, okay, I'll do it. Unconditional obedience. So those five women can teach us a few lessons, can't they? And I think also, 
you might have a different view of genealogies after this and find out they do have a place in scripture and in the genealogies is often some very, very interesting information. All of which, to me, demonstrates God's plan of redemption. Doesn't matter what happens, God wins through. Oh, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the examples that you've given to us in Scripture of people who, while their understanding may not have been what we should have in the New Testament era, they had great faith in you. They placed their hope in you. And Lord, you used them. You changed the circumstances around them to bring your plan of redemption to its fulfilment in your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the one who died for our sin, rose again for our justification, who ascended into heaven, and from there, Lord, he will come to judge the living and the dead. We place our faith and our hope and our trust in him. Amen.